My name is Carolyn Robinson. Uh, I've been an RN for six years. I started out in nursing um, when I was in my early 20s. I went through LPN school and then when my son was grown, I went on to get my associate's degree. Um, prior to that time, I, I work for Dignity Hospice in Chapmanville, West Virginia. Uh, I've had several jobs before this one. Um, Prior to actually getting my associate's degree in nursing, my father suffered an illness. Um, he was cared for in the home, and hospice was, I'm sure, an option at the time, but it was never mentioned to us. So basically, we, for almost three years, cared for him ourselves. Um, no matter how much training or how much schooling you have, you're never prepared or you don't expect if it's your own loved one. If it was it was my father, I was his only child, his, his baby girl, and basically I was responsible and the family looked to me for his care and there were so many things that I know now that I looked over. Um, there were so many ways it could have been better if we had had the guidance of hospice. So, after his passing and he did pass at home. So I'm speaking from experience when I say and I, I know what our patients and their loved ones go through. I knew that there could be a better way. Um, so I explored the hospice option. My heart actually has always been with geriatrics, uh, with elderly people all through school. I've worked in nursing homes, swing beds and hospitals. So I have a background of, of elderly, which Unfortunately, hospice is not always elderly, but that was where my heart was, and going through what I went through on a personal level, I decided to explore hospice, and I've been with Dignity for five years, and I couldn't be happier or sadder at the same time. I think hospice is special because it's individualized, first and foremost, it's personal. Every patient and every family member and every situation is special. Um, being in the hospice field creates a bond with people that you wouldn't normally have on a day-to-day -day basis if you were just seeing them as outpatient or, and I'm speaking from a nursing aspect, uh, you, you have a bond with those people that you'll never have the opportunity to have in any other situation but hospice, and that's special. To the person or family member or multiple family members who misunderstand the concept of hospice, I would certainly start by educating them on the basic level and saying, uh, hospice can offer you so much more. It's not your loved one giving up, it is your loved one making one of the hardest and bravest decisions they'll ever have to make. And if you choose hospice, that allows us to go on that journey with you um, because dying is as important as living. The decision-making process to choose or not to choose hospice is particularly hard on the patient because their feelings are conflicting at times and everybody's instinct is to survive and to live and to want to be with their family as long as they can um, and sometimes that's just not possible and I think a lot of times the patients realize that before the families realize that so it's a conflicting issue because you, you don't want to upset your family members, you don't want to hurt your spouse or your child or your grandchild. You, you want to do everything you can to live, but you need to make this choice so you, patients are not only considering their, themselves and what they're going through, they're trying to consider their family's you know, beliefs and feelings about it as well. So it is conflicting at times. I feel like more often than not, we're helping the family. Um, you know, most of the time when a patient arrives at that point in their life, they've already accepted it. And they, 
they've went through the stages of grief and they're accepting, they're not bargaining, they're not in denial, and, and the family has all these emotions. Um, so we have to try to help them. We provide comfort and peace to the patient. Part of that is by helping their family to understand these processes and to be with them along the way. Some of my personal coping skills, um, it's very hard. I, it's something that is with you all the time. It's not a nine to five job where you go into work and you punch a time clock and you leave work and you punch your time clock and you're done. Um, and you don't think about it until the next morning. It's 24 hours a day. Um, because once you become involved, you're involved. Uh, I rarely ever do I go home and not think about I wonder what's going on with Mrs. So-and-so or, or is Mr. So-and-so okay or how's the family or you know did they do they need me and I even question myself should I have stayed at that extra hour should I you know call and check on them um, it's never uh, out of your head however realistically and practically if we're a mess for lack of a better term, we're no good or no help to anybody. So I have developed certain ways of unwinding each evening. Um, and I do set limits for myself. I, at a certain time in the evening, I say, okay, it's time to stop. I'm, you know, I'm going to turn my TV on. I'm going <clears> to <throat> get on my cell phone. I'm going to do something to distract myself. Um, to give myself that mental break to wind down so that I can get a good night's rest so that I can get up the next day and be ready for my job and whatever it holds. I, I can recall almost every passing, every uh, time I've been with particular families. There are more that stand out than others. Each one is individual, it's different. Um, what you have to realize is each time for that person is either the first time or the only time they've ever been through it. So that's the attitude I take as well. A particular patient that stood out to me, um, it was a male and I had been going there for probably about four to six months and I knew uh, there are signs you know when the person is ready to go, when they're ready to make that transition, most of the time you can tell. Um, and the signs were there. And, but he actually said to me, I don't know how to die. I don't know how to let go. And I have that in my head all the time, so I strive to help that patient let go, to help that patient rest and be at peace and however that is if that's me at the bedside holding their hand if that's me at the foot of their bed their family here um, you know it's different every time but the main thing uh, with that and that gave me perspective I don't know how to die I don't know how to let go so that's what I strive for for each person to help them pass Oh, there are many rewarding things about being a hospice nurse. Um, Abraham Lincoln said, if it's okay if I quote him, to ease another's heartache is to forget one's own. So that's very profound. When I'm with a family, I am grieving with that family. I'm putting everything else on the back shelf. All of my personal needs matters or anything that's going on in my life when I'm with a family, I'm there to ease their heartache. And in turn, that gives me peace that I need. I would tell a family whose loved one is entering into the process of passing or I like to say transitioning into their forever home um, because that's what it is. It's a transition. It's not a goodbye. It's not a final ending. It's a transition. I would 
tell the family that this is probably the most, if not the hardest thing they're going to go through in their life. But letting go is as much loving as holding on. So uh, just sometimes you have to let go. I do have one particular story that sticks out in my mind. Um, it happened to be a family that I knew of, did not know them personally, but knew of. This is a small town, a uh, small area, which has its benefits far outweigh the negative points. Um, so I was familiar with the family. Um, once I started visiting the home and got to know the patient, uh, he, was, he was the head of the household. Um, he was the glue that held the entire family together. He had several children, he had several siblings, and um, he was a very strong, very prideful man, and suddenly, and, and that's always hard, that's particularly hard, suddenly an illness that was completely debilitating. Um, through this process, he, there were times when he did not want anybody around him. Um, as much as his siblings loved him, he was the male, the only male, and he had sisters, several sisters, and they all doted on him. And his daughters, his children were girls, and his grandkids were girls. I think he had a couple of grandsons, but he was very prideful, and it was a particularly hard, hard situation. So he became familiar with me, and, and that happens a lot. They will request a certain nurse, and it's nothing personal. It's just who you get to know who you're used to coming into your home, you know, uh, the, the, the not routine, but what you're used to with that person calling and saying, hey, I'm on my way, or hey, do you need me to pick up something, or, you know, that's just what they become used to. So I had really gotten to know him, because at first he, he sometimes would, you know, sit in the back room, he wouldn't even want to visit. So I got to know him, got to know his family, loved his wife, his children, all of his sisters were just, girly women just you know we could always talk about makeup and jewelry and everything and and what he would say was when she comes it always puts a smile on my family's face which gives me some peace and happiness as well so um, fortunately I was on duty or on call when he started to show the signs of passing you know when he was at the end of his illness um, and he had said no he didn't want anybody in there he doesn't want and all of his family are there uh, and I can remember it in my head um, mostly my heart they were all in different rooms um, you know somewhere in the kitchen somewhere in the living room TV room they were out on the porch they were everywhere and he wanted me and his wife in there with him and the family was of course they were distraught and they were upset and I was providing medication, I was comforting him, I was talking to his wife, I was holding her hand, um, and he said to me, I don't know how to die, I don't know how to let go. Um, and so then we began to talk and I began to assure him, he's, you know, he was concerned that his family wouldn't be okay and, and they couldn't make it without him and so I began to reassure him that they would be um, and talk to him and explain things to him and eventually he let everybody migrate into the room and he had a king size bed he wasn't in a hospital bed he was in a king size bed and the whole bed was full there was not a spot on it anywhere and his family all around him and probably within 15 to 20 minutes he passed so that is one thing that stands out in my mind was the unity. Um, just that simple explanation and reassurance to him. And, and, and that was the answer to his question.